Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Harvey Mansfield. I'm here to introduce. Uh, <coughs> our program tonight is co-sponsored by the Institute of Politics at Kennedy School and by the Program on Constitutional Government in the Government Department. A word about the latter, it has existed since 1985, founded, co-founded by, by Bill Crystal and myself. Uh, we have a motto, and our policy in this is, is in the motto, we invite to Harvard those who would otherwise not be invited. And uh, at least one of our speakers tonight uh, qualifies this. We try to do something to challenge the sickening conformity of political correctness that prevails at Harvard. So our principal speaker tonight is uh, Charles Murray, who's a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, has ne never been a professor, if I'm correct, never, ever. Okay. and is the author of uh, several famous and influential books. Um, I mentioned three, Losing Ground in 1984, uh, The Bell Curve in 1994, uh, Coming Apart, which is the one we're speaking about tonight, The State of White America in 1960 to 2010. He's a self-declared libertarian, is non-professor Murray. And uh, so we'll, he'll have to remain satisfied with, with that, uh, and, our, and we will too. He's won the Irving Crystal Award um, at the AEI. And, and contrary to what we said in our announcement, I hear you, uh, you didn't win a Bradley Prize. Is that correct? I have not. No. Well, that's my mistake, and it's also a mistake with the Bradley Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> he's, the, uh, he's the author of uh, several Murray's Laws, which are, these are not laws that he gives to himself in the manner of Immanuel Kant, but uh, laws about the, the behavior of other people. And then we have, uh, interviewing this uh, um, uh, Charles Murray is, is William Crystal, who's editor of the Weekly Standard. He's in uh, politics and government, has worked in the Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations. On the Republican side, uh, he calls himself a conservative, but he's known to many on the left and uh, to some on the right as the evil genius of neoconservatism. Uh, and, uh, to do, uh, and, and carrying on this, he speaks so occasionally for the public on Fox News, and now recently on ABC. So these two gentlemen, uh, I leave them to their, to their d discussion. Thank you. All right. <laughs> well, thank you, Harvey, and it's good to thank, thank the Kennedy School and the Program of Constitutional Government for having us here. Maybe. Should have had Graham Allison do the introduction. It would have been a little kinder, but that's okay. Um, I see. I taught here for a couple of years, so and Graham was the dean, and so it's nice to be back and see him here. Um, so, Charles Murray, this terrific book you wrote two years ago, "Coming Apart." Tell us in three minutes what the what's what's, what's it's all about. What's coming apart, and why, and why should we be worried about it? Okay, uh, I'll preface that by saying uh, I also appreciate being invited back. The last time I was in this space uh, was February 1995, and I was dating Stephen J. Gould about the bell curve, and people were draped from the rafters. <laughs> it was a terrible experience. Um, <laughs> Coming Apart has a very straightforward thesis, which is that over the course of the last 50 years, we have seen the development of classes in the United States that are different in kind. Uh, from the classes we've had before. We've always had rich people and poor people. That is not new. What is new is a divergence in the culture of the classes. Uh, even though we were not a classless society, even as recently as 1960, on a variety of important social and uh, institutions, I'm thinking of things like marriage, about participation in religion, about, for that matter, participation in, in the labor force. Uh, there were very small differences between working class and upper class. Uh, the paradigmatic example of that uh, is marriage. In 1960, among whites ages 30 to 49, I can explain later why I chose that sample. Basically, it's it's uh, get rid of all the complications associated with ethnicity, and you also have people in the prime of life. So anyway, whites ages 30 to 49, those in the upper middle class, 
in the professions or in managerial positions, 94% were married, essentially as close to 100% as you get in a major social institution. Uh, that's 1960. And as of 2010, 84% were married. Furthermore, uh, the rate of divorce has been declining, and the rate of marriage has held steady in the upper middle class since uh, 1980s. So marriage is alive and well in the upper middle class and in many ways is getting better. In the white working class, meaning those with blue collar jobs uh, or low level service jobs, 1960, 84% were married. So there was a class difference, it was quite small. Marriage was still the overwhelming norm for organizing communities. Uh, by 2010, same population, whites ages 30 to 49, 48% were married. From 84% to 48% in uh, 50 years, that's a huge change. It's a huge divergence. And, and, and so the, the book, because I'm not going to go any longer in describing the thesis, the, the book is, uh, first takes a long look at uh, the new upper class and its culture and its segregation from the rest of the society. And then it takes a long look at the new lower class and does the same thing. And the conclusion at the end of it all is that we are in grave danger of uh, the American project unraveling. And um, I give some minor reasons for optimism, but they're pretty minor. Um, Yuval Levin, who reviewed your book favorably in the Weekly Standard, thought that a lot of the discussion of the book has been about the gulf, the split, the coming apart of the upper middle class and I guess what working class slash lower middle class is. That age of 84 to 48 percent, that's, 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 up, that's, upper, that's upper middle class, which is uh, about uh, 20 percent of the population, and working class, which is about 30. And then there's and a, you've got 50 middle percent 50 in between. Yeah, middle those numbers yeah. would be somewhere between. Yeah, you know, that's exactly right. Um, but that one can talk about the Gulf, and we should, but there's also what the most massive fact when you read the book is the half of the book that's on the what's happened to the working class and lower middle class. That is, you can upper class is sort of interesting, maybe they're more segregated, but actually, empirically, they're sort of living not so differently, it seems, from your data, as their parents and grandparents, where it's this, this massive social decomposition. I don't want to, I mean, maybe it can be worked out and it won't be a decomposition, but let's say massive change in the working class, the white working class, right? This is only whites. Yeah, so yeah. Is really what struck Yuval, and it, he thought that in a way the emphasis on the, the gap between the two classes obscures the just amazing problem or challenge we face. If you know, if 30% of the country is living in, a, in social circumstances that seemingly aren't conducive to their kids having a very good chance to make yeah. them be very successful in America, isn't that just a massive problem? I mean, isn't that is that the most well? Just uh, uh, to cue you for future questions, I think that an equally serious problem is the upper class, not the upper okay. middle, but the upper. We can come back to that. Yeah, in terms of, uh, of what Yuval was worried about, he's right, that you have working class communities which don't function the way they used to in, in fundamental ways. Um, just let me run over some of the ways. I talked about what's happened with marriage. That has a huge impact on social capital uh, because so much of social capital is generated by parents trying to shape the community in ways that will, will help their children. Uh, you've had a huge decline in religiosity. This surprised me. <clears throat> you know, I bought into the idea that uh, the overeducated elites uh, have become highly secular, but that you still had among the working class was a strong hold of religion. Well, yeah, among the overeducated elites, uh, there's been that kind of secularization, but the upper middle class is a much l larger group than that. And uh, religiosity has declined there too, but not nearly as much as it has in the white working class. That's where it's really plummeted. Well, <clears throat> as we all know from Robert Putnam, about 50% of social capital is directly related uh, to religion. And whether it's volunteering or contributions or participations in organizations, when you get that kind of decline in um, religiosity, you also have a whole lot of social capital disappear. So, and, and, and then on top of all that, you have a whole lot of more guys uh, outside the labor force than you had before, and you have a lot more single men in the community. Um, and that has social consequences as well. I mean, the cliche that 
marriage civilizes men is a cliche because it has a lot of truth to it. And, uh, and, and one of the most important chapters in the book in this regard is about a real working class community, Fishtown, uh, taken from a wonderful PhD dissertation uh, done at the University of Pennsylvania where the woman really got her stuff right. And, be, and it's an, the, an important chapter because it brings the statistics to life. The ways in which a formerly highly functional community, maybe tougher than the communities we live in, more bar fights than the communities we live in, but low crime, stable families, uh, lots of good things about it, the way that's pretty much disintegrated. And that's going on not just in urban working class communities, it's going on in Midwest small towns and other places where you wouldn't expect it. The book you sort of say, I'm not, I'm describing the situation, I'm not speculating too much on causes, but you've obviously thought a lot about causality and a lot of the viewers of the book have said, well, you're describing what you say is a social kind of cult and cultural phenomenon, but isn't it caused in large part by economic forces, either ones that we can't control much perhaps, globalization, technology, or ones that we should try to control more and haven't because we're not sufficiently, yeah. whatever redistribution is, or labor friendly in our economic policies. What, talk about causality a little bit. Well, I've made a deliberate conscious decision not to talk about causality because uh, I have not recanted losing ground. I, th I think the social policy changes in the 1960s were a catastrophe for the lower segments of American society because it, they changed the rules of the game, uh, at least in terms of short-term outcomes, that just provided every wrong signal you could provide, and, and it's the working class that suffered for it. I still believe that. I also really wanted people on the left to be able to read Coming Apart without throwing it against the wall. You know, because I know that when I'm when I'm reading a book by uh, who's, where somebody is making an argument I don't necessarily agree with, insofar as as the, uh, I can easily get angry at it and say I don't want to read this anymore. And so I really wanted to say, look, here's the problem, and let's try to agree on the problem, and let's postpone discussion of causes. We can get into, and I imagine in the question and answer period we'll have a chance to do it in more detail. And we can talk about uh, the role of globalization. We can talk about the loss of manufacturing jobs and the rest of it, I'll just give you a little preview which says, do I think that we live in a multi-causal world? Yes. Uh, do I think that those events drove this deterioration? No. You made a point to me when we were talking before that in some ways the causality is not irrelevant, but um, once, it, once it's been caused, it's been caused, and it's now a situation that has to be dealt with by public policy makers yeah. and others to the degree they can, right? That, that is something I've been having a very hard time getting across. Um, but I'll give you an example for one of the things that I'm well known for, that in Losing Ground I talked about the rise in uh, single uh, parent households, overwhelmingly uh, single mother households, and unmarried mother households. And if you go back to initial causes, I would say that changes in the welfare system in the 1960s uh, plus a variety of other collateral changes in social policy uh, were major triggers for uh, a trend which started and has continued so that now, uh, let's see, in the white working class, not, not talking about blacks, not talking about Latinos, in the white working class, about half of all kids are born out of wedlock. Um, uh, uh, now, and among those with less than high school education, 60%. Okay, so you've got this huge hugely important phenomenon. Do I think that the, ch that the increases in that in the last 20 years have been driven by changes in policies in the 1960s? No. I think that once you get that kind of thing started, you also have feedback loops whereby first the economic realities of having a baby without a husband change. But once the economic realities change and a few more people are doing it, the stigma changes too. Uh, because it's one thing to be the lone uh, high school senior girl who is pregnant in a high school, which is a pretty daunting experience, and being one of 15, and where they have a nursery for the children, and where uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, whole, the whole cultural milieu has changed. 
I don't think the causes of the 1960s do a damn thing for us in trying to decide how to deal with, with this issue now because those causes have been superseded by cultural changes. And I think that's also true of uh, the causality of dropout from the labor force. To the extent that it was, let's say, the loss of manufacturing jobs that caused it in the 1970s, that doesn't mean that the culture hasn't changed in ways which aren't fixed by having more jobs now. What about, one last question maybe on the lower working classes, and we'll come back to the upper class, mm -hmm. which you certainly want to discuss here at Harvard. Um, the, in the, uh, we're in the belly of the beast. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> what about the argument, which I've been slightly inclined to at times, that maybe this is just, you know, we see these numbers, and we, I mean, for, you know, good, well-intentioned reasons are kind of horrified and think this is a social disaster, 60% of the kids or whatever, uh, without uh, two parents most of the time at home, and so, but maybe, the world is adjusting, the society is adjusting, the culture is adjusting, the kids will turn out maybe not quite as well as they might have in a ha happier home situation, but okay, that we've found ways to, to work around things that people of our generation look at and think, oh my God, this is just terrible. I mean, yeah. do you think there's some possible truth to that? Do you, are the, I guess, are the outcomes as bad as you would expect from the disin from the trends you see, I guess the outcomes would be criminality, lack of being able to hold a job, I mean the actual objective things that people who grow up in those circumstances do or don't achieve. Well, first point is that we're talking about tendencies and so you are not doomed because you're born into a single parent family. Uh, we're talking about statistical tendencies. <coughs> and those tendencies have been quite well documented. Uh, this literature's gotten quite large. It's not a conservative literature. Sarah McClanahan, uh, at Princeton, is one of the leading scholars in this area, and people like her and me agree basically 100% on the nature of the problem. Um, the, the real issue is, Bill, is, is, is this going something we can adapt to? To what extent is it an option that kids can be socialized in new forms of family structures as well as old ones once we get used to it? And to what extent are we evolutionarily hardwired uh, so that the best nurturing for, for Homo sapiens infants is with uh, uh, two adults who are the biological parents? In our growing knowledge of evolutionary biology and genes and the rest of it, which is, as everybody knows, is on a nonlinear trend since the genome was decoded, there's a lot of reasons for thinking we're pretty hardwired in this regard. Um, I'll just take a couple of examples of that, uh, that will illustrate what, what I mean. Um, as, as young girls come uh, to puberty and so forth, and they're in a very vulnerable phase of their life, um, it has been observed by lots of psychologists that, that the father serves as the first boyfriend. That, that the father, by providing an intimate relationship, in, a, in effect buffers uh, the young woman from, uh, from engaging in sexual relationships which she's not really ready to handle yet. And also the father serves the function of threatening to kill the young men who <laughs> behave inappropriately. Uh, well, that, that could very well be something that's deeply ingrained in the way that the psychologies of, of, of girls develop and, and it can't be changed. It, it also, for those in the audience who have had both girls and boys as children, I will simply tell you, as a father who had three girls and then one boy, I was struck immediately by my little boy wasn't giving me the same kind of unconditional love the little girls did. My, my little boy was watching me. Uh, this is how grown-up males are supposed to behave. And uh, if, if you don't have that guy in the house, who do they glom on to? Well, they glom on to the most admirable boys they can find, which in their eyes are adolescent males worse role models than which you cannot get. To what degree is that just the way little boys function and always will? And if that's the case, we aren't going to get a whole lot better at this. We're, we're, it's going to be basic deficits in child rearing that you can't work around. And it is the case, is it? I mean, I, that 
sort of in, empirical indicators of how you know, the average kids who grow up in the I don't know, 25th, 35th, whatever percentile socioeconomically do 20 years later. Social mobility, economic opportunity, higher education, how their kids then do. Do we see a degeneration of opportunity and social mobility? I mean, shouldn't that be, we would expect that from you your, you could, you from your argument, yeah, right? In terms of parent, uh, family formation and, and family well, structure. And actual outcome. I mean, do they, oh, yeah, no, do, uh, they do less well relative to their upper middle class essentially, cohort. Essentially, and this is the literature that it's kind of a strange situation. It, it's true for a variety of issues in academia this way. There's a very large technical literature that is exactly opposite to a lot of the rhetoric. And the rhetoric is the family is changing, and uh, the old two-parent family was patriarchal anyway, and in many ways dysfunctional. You had spouse abuse and all that. And, uh, and to say that uh, things are getting worse in the family is retrograde and Neanderthal. And then you have this technical literature which says, after controlling for a socioeconomic status, after controlling for education, after controlling for all the usual su suspects, uh, the outcomes for children on a huge range of measures. Everything from emotional development to likelihood of going to jail to likelihood of being unemployed, you name it. Uh, on a huge range of measures, uh, the hierarchy of outcomes for children goes as follows. The best outcomes statistically are for the parents, two parents, both biological parents, a very important consideration. Uh, remarried couples do next best. Stepfathers don't help that much compared to women raising children alone. Statistically, they work out about the same. And way down at the bottom, uh, distinctly lower in all the outcomes, are children of uh, unmarried women, and it doesn't make much difference if they're cohabiting. In fact, it makes virtually zero difference if they're cohabiting. And, and a working class kid, you know, the set of kids born in 1960 in Fishtown have, I guess one would expect this from your argument, a better chance of being middle class adults Much better. in 1980 than the working class kids born in 1990 do in 2010. I mean, have we seen yeah. a decrease in social mobility and economic opportunity? Because I think that would be implied by your Well, we've argument. seen a decrease in social mobility, period. So then you have to say what caused that. So is there a decrease in social mobility? Yeah. Uh, do, do I think I can point to a variety of causal links which say, here's why uh, uh, there's a de decrease in social mobility and it is linked to family structure? I think that case can be made, but it's certainly not simple, you know, it's not a simple analytic case to make. But the life prospects of those yeah. kids from Fishtown are not as bright as they were 50. I mean, oh, that's, all that, that that's correct. For all that's that we correct. progress as a society in so causes. many ways, you're saying that a working class kid 50 years ago in a certain sense had a better chance in America than a working class kid today because the, of the greater likelihood that the working class kid today comes from... That's one cause. There are well, leaving side causes. Yeah, there are others. But yeah. You are saying that that's the yeah. case. Yeah. 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 Okay, what about the upper class? Uh, Oh, good. We spent half, now we we spend half the book. They seem to be doing fine. You're kind of harsh on them. Oh, they're, no. you know, they're getting married. <laughs> they're doing well. Their kids are going, they're going Up, to Upper middle class is different from upper class. Here's my definition of the upper class. We've got a broad upper class, which is defined as the most successful 5% of people in managerial and professional positions. In effect, that means the people who are sort of the most powerful, influential people in, in individual cities, uh, sometimes at the state level. Then you have the narrow elite, uh, the narrow upper new upper class, which consists of those people who have national impact on American culture or economics or politics. And that's a fairly small population, probably somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000. Furthermore, they are very highly concentrated in uh, a few areas of the country. Because if you have national impact in those areas, you're probably in Washington, D.C., and or New York City, or Los Angeles, California, or the uh, Silicon Valley, largely defined. Or the Kennedy School. So you have, you have or the Kennedy. Yeah, the, well, the, let's not go there. <laughs> uh, you, these two kinds of upper class have developed a very distinctive culture, and all the people in this room, uh, just about, I would imagine, uh, live in that culture now. And uh, many of you have lived in that culture all your life. Uh, we, and I will say we, uh, we eat different foods than uh, the mainstream America. 
generally speaking, we eat more healthily. Um, generally speaking, we are a lot thinner. Bill and I are here to indicate this is not always true. I, I consider this a form Working of Working class solidarity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. I consider it a form of protest on my part, <laughs> uh, Bill, to be overweight. Um, we raise children differently from mainstream America. We watch uh, much less TV. Downton Abbey and maybe Breaking Bad is about it. <laughs> um, whereas the average TV in this country is on for more than 26 hours a day, I think. Um, <laughs> I mean, sorry, <laughs> no, 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 we, oh, no, there's the, uh, uh, the uh, well, I've, I've, now I've messed up the numbers and I won't try to retrieve it, but TV is on a lot in, in mainstream America. Uh, in terms of movies, we go to different movies. The, um, go on different kinds of vacations. We have, we have a culture in which we are all very comfortable uh, and once you get outside the confines of that culture, life in America is quite different. But the thing is that because of residential segregation that's taken place, we now have bubbles that consist in, in some cases of hundreds of thousands of people who live in close proximity to each other. I defined, uh, in the course of the book, I took all of the zip codes in the country and I constructed an index based on education and income. And I ranked all the uh, zip codes in the country, and I took the top 5% on this index and called them super zips. Well, in the Washington, D.C. area, you now have a bubble of contiguous super zips that encompasses more than a million people. Uh, in Boston, uh, you have out in the western suburbs and so forth, a uh, bubble of uh, a couple hundred thousand people, I believe. Uh, and and some, the same goes for the New York area and for Los Angeles. It go, it's true to some degree for all the large cities, but it's the megalopolises that really have the big bubbles. Here's, here's the problem with um, the new upper class and why I get extremely worried about it. It used to be that if you took the powerful people in the United States, they were powerful, but they did not come from a uniform background. So that if you took the cabinets of uh, Eisenhower or John Kennedy, for that matter, the, the majority, the large majority of the people in those cabinets grew up as the sons of, uh, and in some couple of cases, daughters, of, uh, of merchants, of uh, factory workers, of tenant farmers, of small farmers. They, they were... They were powerful people, but they still remembered what it was like to be in middle class or working class America. Increasingly, we have people coming to positions of great power who have been in this bubble all their lives. And there is an asymmetry here. Uh, it does not matter if a truck driver cannot empathize with the priorities of the people in this room or of... Uh, Yale law professors or whoever. It makes a great deal of difference if Yale law professors or the people in this room who rise to positions of influence or the Commerce Secretary do not understand the priorities of truck drivers. Understand them not intellectually, but understand them in some empathetic way where they have some kinds of experiences where they understand that life. And increasingly, that's the case. And along with that, now I am getting longer answers than I should, no, but I, I get exercised about this. Um, it used to be that the people in power were very nervous about being show-offs. Um, I'll give you a, an anecdotal version of this. It used to be that um, successful executives, people making plenty of money to buy Cadillacs, which 50 years ago were the only, that was the only prestige car in town, wouldn't buy them because if they bought them, they were getting too big for their britches. They were separating themselves. Uh, you didn't build a 10,000-square-foot home, even if you could afford to build a 10,000-square-foot home, because that was kind of un-American. You didn't do that. Uh, you, you, you were obedient to the unenforceable in terms of standards of seemliness. And there was also a very strong cultural imperative to say you were middle class and to identify yourself with the middle class. Uh, that's what Americans did. 
and it was a very endearing aspect of American culture, and it was also a very functional aspect of American culture. We have a real problem now of an upper class that is perfectly happy of thinking of itself as an upper class. What are the only derogatory words you can use for groups of people in the United States at this point at Harvard University? You can still call people redneck. You can still call it flyover country. Those, and you can also call, you can use derogatory phrases for fundamentalist Christians. <laughs> Those are the only people you can dump on, still legitimately. And I think that that is symptomatic of a, a new upper class that is increasingly thinking of itself as an upper class smarter than the rest of America, able to make decisions on behalf of the rest of America for their own good. And that is a fundamental betrayal of what this country's been all about. And what is to be done about this? There was a uh, book published recently which is telling what ought to be done about things like this. And the author referenced uh, coming apart and said, Murray offers little more than plaintive moralizing, which is what you just got a few minutes ago. Uh, well, there's a lot to be said for plaintive moralizing. Okay. And, and the reason I say that, <laughs> the reason I say that is, is look, I'm all in favor of uh, a stronger economy and more jobs being available and better education for kids. I'm in favor of all of the, uh, the kinds of things that might help improve the lives of people. They aren't going to get at the cultural problems I'm talking about. One of the interesting phenomena, that, uh, one of the interesting things I noticed as I was writing the book is a lot of these things that have happened are collateral bad effects of things that were good in themselves. You know, a lot of them are the effects of, uh, in the 1950s, we started getting much more efficient at identifying the most talented kids and shipping them off to Harvard and Yale and Princeton. I came from a small town in Newton, Iowa in 1961 here. I would never have come to Harvard 20 years before that. that. It's good that you were widening the net and bringing in people, but it's also fostered the kind of segregation I'm talking about. It's good that women started going into the workforce and were not as economically dependent on men. It had powerful effects, I think demoralizing effects, on working class males as a result. You don't want to not have done the thing, but you have to accept that there have been collateral bad, bad effects. If you, have cultural, if you have culturally grounded problems of this kind, I think the solutions are going to have to be cultural. Uh, and the United States has had a history of having cultural reawakenings. Uh, three or four of them, depending on who's counting, uh, were religious great awakenings that had profound effects on American politics, on American culture. Um, but also something like the Civil Rights Movement is a good example. The Civil Rights Movement went from a standing start in 1954 to the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 in 10 years. Um, so these things can happen. So it would be really important for the, what I've called uh, the new upper class to have a cultural reawakening where they stopped thinking of themselves as a new upper class, where they started to try to engage uh, more and get their kids to engage more in the life of mainstream America. And I don't think it's going to happen until there have been cultural shifts. I do not have any kind of uh, public policy program that's going to fix this. Why don't we take some questions on that note um, at a public policy school. I, I have a lot of questions, but I'm sure you all have questions. And I think we have two mics, and I can't <coughs> the light. Four mics, I'm sorry. Two on this floor and two up there, and I'll just go around if, uh, if I can from one mic to the next. So why don't I begin here? Hey, Mr. Murray, um, thank you for coming. My name is Justin. I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. I'm a former Navy pilot and a bit of a career transition. Um, you mentioned you didn't want to talk too much about causality, so I'll give you a causality question. If you don't want to answer that, I'll give you an no, easy follow-up question. No, I didn't talk about it in the book, but I'll talk about it now. Okay, okay. great. Uh, so at the beginning of your talk, you used marriage as a proxy um, for a class divergence, a socioeconomic class divergence. I'm curious what role, if any, you feel that the war on drugs has played and the massive rates of incarceration, incarceration uh, among certain socioeconomic classes, and especially that marriage divergence, but also labor force participation divergence, uh, and so on. 
I'm pausing because a lot of the things I'm talking about took off. Uh, it, let's, let's think, for example, about the drop in marriage, to stick with that example. That started to plummet in the 1960s and kept on going down throughout the 1970s. The incarceration rates, uh, no, I'll take that, I'll rephrase that. The raw number of people incarcerated in the United States actually dropped from the mid-1960s to the early 1970s. The raw number, and of course, relative to the amount of crimes committed, it plummeted. And then it started to creep up. But essentially, you are not looking at large-scale incarceration uh, until the 1980s. And by that time, a lot of these phenomena that I've talked about were well underway. And in fact, in many cases, the bulk of the, the, uh, the drop had occurred before that. So in that sense, I would say, I don't think that that explains much. Subsequent to that, however, we have had this, this uh, two million people uh, incarcerated now. That, that, has to have, that has to have had some effect. I, I don't know how you calibrate that. I would, however, say that even when they are incarcerated for reasons I don't think they should be incarcerated for, I don't think they should be in there for drug crimes, for example, even in those cases, we are not talking about men who looked like real good marriage prospects, even if they hadn't been put in jail. I think you have a more fundamental problem of a uh, cultural problem of American males becoming a lot more feckless over the course of the last 40, 50 years. There's an inflammatory word. Uh, Bex, you want to go, we'll go around the different mics. Sir. Okay, uh, Mary, I was just wondering, uh, you talk about different classes. What about the government class? Uh, has it become more arrogant and uh, imposing upon us uh, um, programs and, and laws and uh, enforcements that are, that are not naturally developed in society and, and creating problems thusly along the lines you outlined? Well, they overlap a lot um, insofar as, for example, you take the Washington bubble I talked about. That includes both, uh, that includes an awful lot of the, the people in government that you're talking about there. And furthermore, the education of, I guess I'm not talking about lower level bureaucrats, but if you take a look at the, the regulators, the people who run the regulatory agencies and the rest of it, they are increasingly exactly what I'm talking about in terms of people who are imposing a lot of regulations on behaviors, economic behaviors, and other kinds of behaviors, which they have themselves have had no personal experience with. I mean, they, they, are, they are imposing land use regulations on ranchers and farmers, for example, when they haven't a clue what the lives of ranchers and farmers are like. Um, it, it is, I guess I'm agreeing with you. I think that the segregation of the classes uh, has manifested, its, its harmful results have manifested themselves most directly uh, in public policy. I think they've also manifested themselves in the entertainment industry uh, and, uh, and in other aspects of American life, but policy has been the most harmful. Up there. Hi, my name is Autumn Lawrence and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, Nick Kristoff wrote a beautiful op-ed recently where he talked about the importance of empathy in society, um, and you just talked about this as well a moment ago, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you feel the role of empathy or the existence of it um, has changed over the last 50 years or so, um, and what role you think empathy can and should play going forward. Okay. Um, <coughs> the empathy initially was because of your own personal life experiences. So that if you had grown up in a uh, small town in uh, Nebraska, uh, and then you ended up as an investment banker living in Park Avenue, you still remember what that small town in Nebraska was like. But even after that happened, uh, there, there were still sources. So that you would have kids who grew up, you know, they were born in Potomac, Maryland, but dad comes from a small town in Nebraska, and every summer they go out and spend a couple of weeks with grandpa and grandma. And, and so at least you get to see what that world is like. And then you move to the third generation, 
and grandpa and grandma uh, live in Greenwich. So you go from your home in Potomac to visit grandpa and grandma in Greenwich, and you are not exposed. Uh, let me just add one other thing about empathy here. I think we have a real problem with faux empathy um, because you have lots of kids who, in high school, uh, their parents make sure that they volunteer one night a week at the local soup kitchen or that they spend a week working for Habitat for Humanity, um, which I think are good things. I'm not against these, but I think first you can assume you know a whole lot more because of those kinds of experiences than you really do. But the larger problem is this. You have lots, I bet lots of students at Harvard who did this kind of public service thing in both now in Harvard and also before you came here, among other things, because it strengthened your application. And you have had some contact with the most disadvantaged elements of American society. What I think kids in the new upper class are most likely to have missed is contact with the great middle, people who don't have a lot of problems, who are taking care of their own lives, who are dealing with their, you know, have functional communities, and those are the people you've never had any contact with. So from, I shouldn't say you, I'm, I'm indicting all of you, and I'm sure that's unfair, we, let's, I'll use the grand we, because there's a problem with the new upper class, that we tend to see American society in terms of the 1%, uh, the elites, and the oppressed, and the disadvantaged, and it's sort of like that New Yorker um, map of the United, no, that's way too <laughs> long ago for most of you to recognize. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a case of obliviousness to the very large chunk of the American population that is neither disadvantaged nor is it elite and, and powerful. Sir? I don't know if there's such a word as fatherlessness, uh, but the recent comments by President Obama about the pain he experienced in growing up from the absence of his biological father, uh, and, and uh, we all know that uh, this pain was in spite of the fact that his, his um, maternal grandfather and that his mother uh, were heavily involved in his raising. Uh, I'd just like to hear your comments about President Obama's recent comments on this issue. Thank you. I think they were great. Uh, I, I, th I think using the bully pulpit in that way was, is really important. We, we have a, it's part of the polarization of American politics, but that kind of discussion can foster what I think should be the general attitude towards something like kids growing up in single parent homes, which is uh, we all wish these kids well, and to the extent that, that we can help, we want to help, uh, and they are not doomed. But boy, it's really also important, uh, it, it's good for the next generation of kids if you can have more fathers engaged. In doing this, the real barrier is that when you raise those issues, you tend to get demonized, you, you, no, excuse me, you, you tend to be accused of demonizing unmarried women. And nobody wants to do that, uh, understandably. That kind of a comment that, that Barack Obama made is, is one way of getting around that. I think it's also okay if we start demonizing the men who uh, aren't engaged in the lives of their children. I don't see anything wrong with that. I, I, th there's a lot of reason to be sympathetic with the single mother who's trying to cope with raising kids. I think guys who walk away from having fathered children, it's okay to call them bums and a lot worse and to, to, to say publicly that they are, they are uh, neglecting one of the most important duties that a, that a male can have, and that is to be a father to his children. So that's, that's the new Murray uh, solution to our problem, demonize unmarried dads, uh, not unmarried mothers. Mr. Murray, my there. son is a student at Duke, and uh, he texted me that you, there were protests there and students walked out, so I just want to say I'm proud of the polite response you, you got here. My question has to do with possible ways of addressing the problems that you lay out. I'm impressed with the preparation for life that National Military Service gives uh, 
young people in Israel, and I just wondered whether national service is something that you've thought of as a possible solution. Well, I agree with those people who say that uh, military service, especially during World War II, was a huge homogenizing influence, uh, if not homogenizing, giving people uh, experience with uh, all different kinds of classes. Um, here's the pra and, and I would, in principle, be in favor of exposing people 21, 22, 23-year-olds, 23-year-olds uh, to the same kind of service. The problem is scale, so that the military can't possibly affect more than a few hundred thousand uh, out of the millions in each new generation. And if you try anything much broader than that, you're going to set up a situation where most of the, of the people who are in it don't want to be in it. Suppose you had compulsory national service. Uh, and I also assure you that it would backfire because you could have draftees in the army because those draftees might not, re they really didn't want to be there, but they were also subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And so they really didn't much have much choice. A civilian program would be never, never be run that, like that. And so you would have lots of people who wouldn't want to be there and they'd start to game the system. And I think you'd run into the danger of, of um, exacerbating uh, divisions rather than diminishing them. On a smaller scale, voluntary programs are great. I think Teach for America is a great idea. Uh, there are other kinds of programs that I would like to see as, as voluntary ways in which people can engage in national service, but I think it has to be voluntary. Uh, there's a British uh, social scientist, I think her name is uh, Hilary Wolf, uh, and she's written about the emergence of what she calls fortress couples. Uh, as a result of, in some ways, feminism, where we now have not just one very high wage earner in a family, but two. I mean, you can especially see this at Harvard, where now all the law professors are married to other law professors are the like, uh, as opposed to the way it was t 20 years ago. So she sees certain problems with these very high income fortress couples and everybody else. And this is a result of, to some degree, women entering the workforce and feminism. I wonder if you might comment. Well, is income the problem or, well, th th you've raised an issue uh, that has lots of ramifications because it sounds to me like she's talking particularly about upper socioeconomic levels, right? Yes. So you have a couple of phenomena going on there. Uh, which is uh, one of the most important of which has nothing to do with the uh, income of the family, but of the non-monetary assets they're handing down to their kids. Which is to say, when you have two law professors married to each other, uh, the chances that uh, both of them have really high IQs are very high, and the odds that their kids will also have pretty high IQs is also high. There will be a regression to the mean, but the next, you, you've had homogamy that's been going on now, educational homogamy, which has been increasing for 50 years. It's another case of a good thing having a negative collateral result. It is a good thing that you, that you have all of the talented kids going to college, but they are going to meet each other and marry each other in a much more systematic way than they did in the bad old days when a great deal, a great many of the most talented kids never got to college. So. It doesn't bother me so much that the two uh, fortress couples, fortress, is that she the word? Fortress uh, that they make a lot of money. Um, it, it has had, in, it, it's had important effects on the stickiness of social status. You know, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations is very, very likely if the person who made the money in the first generation married a person of just average abilities. And I'm not talking about only about IQ. I'm talking about persistence, drive, uh, enthusiasm, imagination, all sorts of qualities. If only one of the two parents has those qualities, odds are the third generation will have lost the money, spent the money, and be back with everybody else. <laughs> um, when you have uh, people passing down a lot of talent to their kids, classic example in the news, the relationship between SAT scores 
and socioeconomic status. As the SAT announced the revision of the essays as a test, um, with everybody saying, oh, it must be these parents are buying all these terrific uh, prep courses and sending their kids to terrific uh, schools, and that's why they're getting no high scores. No, it's not. Uh, maybe that contributes a little bit, but mostly they're getting the high SAT scores because they're smart. And, uh, and, and you are getting a concentration of talent uh, correlated with uh, social status. I've just actually made uh, a lot of the arguments that Dick Ernstein and I made in a book called The Bell Curve 20 years ago. At that time, we were saying these are phenomena that we see as being problematic in the future. In Coming Apart, I'm saying these are phenomena that are already here and are problematic now. Thank you. Hi, and uh, thank you for the talk. Just by way of disclaimer, I wanted to say that I, um, my father died when I was a young girl, and I was raised by a single black mother in Washington, D.C., and I turned out okay. I made you it here okay. for college and law school, and I'm charmed that you just referenced the rule against perpetuities. Um, uh, but that biography does underwrite a certain amount of skepticism about some claims, so I wanted to ask you. Sure. You said in the very first part of your remarks that marriage is a norm for organizing communities. It's certainly not the only norm. Um, I recognize the arguments that you're making that the social circumstances of marriage are conducive to success and that there's social capital that flows from the family. But I wanted to ask you about other norms for organizing communities whereby the social capital is flowing, for example, from the state. Um, we can talk about the economic sustainability of those models in Europe, but there are certainly, through universal preschool and other things like that, other modes for flowing social capital to people in positions like me um, that don't have to do with marriage at all. Could you respond? Sure. Um, well, let's take something like universal pre-K as an example. The really surprising thing about the most intensive pre-K programs, ones that could not possibly be replicated on a national scale, is how little they accomplish. We, we've historically had, we had Perry Preschool with something like 50 kids in the uh, experimental group and the Abyssidarian Project, which had maybe 70, which have been used as examples of, gee, these programs really had big impacts. And there were a variety of methodological reasons to say, well, they're kind of dicey. But they have been used as uh, rhetorically as, as saying, look what we could do if only we had universal pre-K. Well, we've had replications of very intensive uh, pre-K in the form of the infant health development program, uh, which, did, uh, which had good samples, it had good control groups, it had very intensive intervention with young kids in deeply in need of intervention and they follow them through to 18 years. It was the typical story of the three-year follow-up at age three, some really positive results. At age five, those positive results had attenuated. By age 18, they had disappeared. Um, so if you take something like universal pre-K and you ask me, does it sound plausible that you can intervene from outside and supply some of these assets that the two-parent family provides. A priori, I, I'm going to say, yeah, I, I, I think probably you could get a lot out of that. I would say, since I'm before an audience at a public policy institute, that if you go back to the Coleman Report in 1966, which fully expected to see a lot of variation in student uh, outcomes based on the kind of school they were going to, and they were appalled to find that they couldn't find that, that basically the history of trying to intervene in the lives of children from the 1966 Coleman Report right up to the most recent national evaluation of Head Start, which came out a year or so ago, has been a uniform, very depressing story of the limits of what can be done by trying to make up for the assets that, that are not in the family. Again, I'm speaking statistically. I think I, before you stood up and asked your question, I did say that lots of kids from single parent families would do just fine. But our ability through public policy in the United States to intervene has effectively, has been really hard to demonstrate. One other quick, uh, because you alluded to, to Europe. Um, point number one, 
Swedish Americans do just about as well as Swedes do. Danish Americans do just about as well as Danes do. There, is a, there are a great many ways in which the welfare states of Europe uh, have a population that they're dealing with, which in the United States is a population that does really well. And you also have some of the welfare states of Europe uh, which don't do so well, and those populations don't necessarily do so well here either. I am saying culture has a lot to do with how the welfare state in Europe works. That's point number one. Point number two is you are seeing in Europe the same kinds of problems developing and expanding as I describe in Coming Apart. Um, there is a certain amount of, um, well, there's a lot of ruin in a nation, as Adam Smith said, and there's also a certain amount of half-life of cultural capital. And I think that the uh, countries of Western Europe have been spending down their cultural capital over the last two or three generations, and it's starting to show. I don't, I don't propose that answer as being something that should change your mind, but I think it's something you ought to think about. Um, Mr. Murray, um, thank you for coming, and thank you for your work over, over many years. Um, I'm curious about something we didn't really discuss, that, that libertarian label. Uh, I myself uh, was once the editor of the Harvard Libertarian as an undergraduate, and I like to think my horizons subsequently widened a bit. Um, but uh, for me, um, something that kind of changed my thinking was coming to see education, especially moral education, as somehow the central task of society and does America, has America in our lifetimes, is what we've most needed more freedom or something in a different direction? Um, kind of on large questions, do we learn more about what ails our country now from libertarian authors or from Plato and, and Tocqueville, um, even at the high end, the problems that you're discussing, they're kind of coming much more slowly at that upper middle class, but they're still coming. They're still coming. Um, there's, there's still a, a, a development that's unfolding, um, kind of on those large questions, on, on narrower questions, kind of I'm attracted to unlibertarian solutions or unlibertarian approaches to kind of improving wages for working class people, like maybe some modest protectionism or some restriction of immigration that, that means less competition for low-end jobs. I've lived much of the last 10 years in um, um, uh, Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, and I gotta say, it's really tough for working class guys, the competition, um, na native-born people, the competition they face from uh, uh, workers who are not native-born, um, good people, of course, but you know, more supply of um, non-college educated labor means uh, lower lower wages. Yeah. So, what it, what it, wh how's the libertarian approach de dealing with these things? Well, uh, first I would say I wrote a book in 1988, which is still the favorite of all the book, my favorite of all the books I've written, called In Pursuit, uh, which was both uh, very libertarian in its philosophy and also very strong on moral teaching. Uh, so, for example, there was a lot of Aristotle in that book and the Nicomachean Ethics. And, uh, and I would also say that in subsequent writings, to me, the role of the university, the principal role in many of the liberal arts education ought to be to get students to think seriously, drawing upon the best that has been thought and set, written uh, about what the meaning of life is. And, uh, and, and, and I think the abdication of that responsibility by the university has had enormous bad effects. Uh, so I think we're on the same page with moral education. As far as, as the extent to which I, my libertarian principles uh, are modified by policy realities, I have another book called In Our Hands, which advocates a uh, large guaranteed basic income to replace uh, the welfare state, uh, going to everybody age 21 and over, and a uh, fairly generous uh, system as well. And I think that that represents the kind of grand compromise that sooner or later we may be fiscally forced to consider. The compromise goes like this. Uh, we on the right, libertarian right, uh, will give you on the left big government in terms of expenditures because the plan I proposed would cost as much as the current system does. Uh, if you on the left will give us small government in terms of the ability of the government to stage manage people's lives. And I think that kind of compromise has a potential for drawing in allies 
from a variety of political perspectives. If I can, if I can take the last question or two here, I'm since I'm sympathetic to this gentleman's question, but that doesn't really answer. It seems to me, I mean, Orwin Felser had a piece in the Standard Week recently, also moving away from a previously more libertarian or pure free market approach, saying you need to help think about, we need to think hard about how to make work pay better than not working, and the it may just be that the natural market now, where A, we're generous with the social safety net benefits, and B, the market for various reasons doesn't reward certain kinds of work much. And of course, we have the organization tax credit, so maybe there are other things we could or should do that would be interventionist to make work pay, which your system, I think, is that's simply a safety net. I mean, not simply, it's a safety net for everyone, but it's, does it address the problems of the the working class whites in the Shenandoah Valley. Well, actually, it does. But let's not, let's not get okay. into that. Let's let's not get into details because I think I think that what we are talking about here is a common understanding that crosses political lines. A strong back isn't used worth what it used to be uh, for reason for macroeconomic reasons that are not going to go away, and uh, we have to come up with ways of augmenting the income of people who got the short end of the stick in terms of where their talents lie. And there are a variety of ways you can go about doing that. We've got the proposals for huge increases in minimum wage, some of them coming from the libertarian right. Uh, we have earned income tax credit. We have gu guaranteed basic income. I think that there is a lot of potential for major augmentation of wages uh, of income at the low end. And, and again, I will engage in a very rare uh, bit of optimism. I think that there's, there's ways of talking across the political divide on these issues that you ought to be able to reach some kind of, of action. So let me ask that maybe as a final question if you want to add any extra okay. remarks as well, which is, that, I mean, I do think along those lines, I mean, it's a rare moment of optimism, but isn't it, it does seem to me to be the case that to some degree some of these policy debates are more are less predictable and people are becoming a little more, are trying to think things through in a slightly fresh way now, maybe more than five or 10 years ago. And I think that might be true about the response to this book too, compared to Losing Ground or The Bell Curve. I mean, or am I not, is that, how much do you see that happening out there in the, in the academy, in the public policy, professional public policy world, in the political world? Are we, or is this just a kind of couple of good, <laughs> couple of swallows that don't make a summer? summer yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll conclude, I guess, with uh, a personal example. Because the short answer to your question is, come on, um, within the academia, you don't, I don't see a lot of reaching across the lines. I certainly don't see it in the US House of Representatives, so forth. But let me give you another, the personal example is that I have four children that are now ranging in age from 24 to uh, 44. They all love their dad. They are not rebelling against me. Not one of them would consider voting for a Republican. Now, mind you, I'm not a Republican myself, but, but some of they wouldn't vote. People like me end up voting for Republicans instead of Democrats, even though we sometimes have to hold our nose when we do it. Um, and, and why wouldn't they vote for Republicans? Because that's not, you know, they actually, they're pretty, they're much in favor of freedom the, the way I am. Uh, they don't like huge budget deficits. In all sorts of ways, I think, that, gee, they ought to be voting for Republicans, but they are completely turned off by Republicans because of social issues. And they are so turned off uh, that uh, th they just won't, they don't want to think of themselves as Republicans, so they won't vote for Republicans. And I think if you went to Silicon Valley, where you have, you know, they vote Democratic in Silicon Valley by, you know, 80-20, but you have basically they're libertarians out there in their views about entrepreneurship and, uh, and the rest of it. I think that we have, um, there is a, I don't want to call silent majority, is not the phrase I want to come up with. There is a coalition of a lot of people who vote Democratic and a lot of people who vote Republican who uh, would find common cause in a lot of, uh, of uh, issues involving uh, budget deficits and uh, amount of regulation we ought to have or not have. And, and other things, and there is a kind of false polarization that has occurred be, but because Democratic candidates have to pass litmus tests uh, to get through their primaries, and Republicans have to pass social issue litmus tests in their primaries. 
and and it's it's hiding a potential for the kind of region of Ross we're, we're talking about. However, since my record as a political analyst is way worse than Bill Crystal's, uh, I that's, don't want to. That's wanna, not true. Right? I don't want. <laughs> I don't want to. Very low bar. You should. You it. probably shouldn't pay too much attention to anything I've just said on that. Issue. Well, I would just say on that, if I could just quarrel for one second, since we have about two more minutes. The um, I spoke. I mean, one could argue, of course, that you and your wonderful kids are living in a bubble of. Um, you know, we're, hey, we're pro-free market, but we're also libertarian on all these social issues, and if only everyone were like us in Silicon Valley, it would be great. I emceed a, a, a pro-life dinner, actually, in, in Washington last night, seated the Anthony List, which supports pro-life candidates, especially women, and Mike Huckabee was the uh, keynote speaker and gave a fantastic populist talk, I would say, which is the exact opposite, which is that if we, in fact, there's huge numbers of Americans who are culturally conservative, closer to the Republican, view on some of these issues, but actually their moms depend on Medicare, they themselves, Social Security is a major part of uh, their expected retirement income, and they're not anti-big government, they're not libertarian, uh, they don't think that, you know, the future is going to be, they're going to be in a lot of jobs provided by Silicon Valley. So, I mean, I agree that the political parties don't capture these divisions, but I suppose the question is, which is the actual possible silent majority out there? Is it the sort of, you know, working class, culturally conservative types who are now split, uh, or, or the libertarian types, or it's both. I mean, I'm I suppose you could also make a case that political parties in America traditionally have precisely done what you want to be done, which is forced elites to deal with non-elites who are different from them and who do have different views on cultural and social issues. I have no response. Well, I don't <laughs> it's just it's a question or a problem. It's not a... Not a solution, but I think that, I mean, I guess what I would say is that precisely because you're right, I think one of the powerful themes of your book, and I will say a word about your book, um, one of the things I found in rereading it just uh, last week is there's so much interesting information in it. I mean, the argument is very powerful. The arguments, the major arguments are very powerful, but there's just a ton of interesting data and information, which is itself thought-provoking, and you lay it out extremely clearly, so for that, we, we owe you a debt, uh, even if not everyone, hard as it is to believe, doesn't agree with every... They don't agree with every with every argument, but um, in any case, we'll, we can we can continue our our discussion. But um, I want to thank you for coming here. Thank the Kennedy School and the Program for Constitutional Government to, for hosting us, and thank you all for uh, attending. Thank you.